I want to welcome you to podcast eight of Civility Speaks with me, uh, Robert Sachs. This is actually the week where the book, uh, The Path of Civility, my book will be released to the public. I want to let you know that therefore, if you see this podcast in this week or any time afterwards, you can now go to Amazon or contact me and you'll be able to get it relatively quickly, uh, as well as the ebook, which has been out for some time. So I'm really happy about that, and I'll talk about some events that are going to be happening uh, later on after I do my presentation, which is a continuation of what I talked about two weeks ago. Last week, if you recall, I was talking with uh, Russ Charvonia of the Worldwide Civility Council, and the week before, I was talking about different aspects of compassion. There being four aspects of compassion, pacifying, enriching, and then magnetizing or charismatic and wrathful. And we talked about the first two because those first two are the ones that are the easiest and probably the ones that we're most familiar with. They are very helpful, for example, in terms of keeping the peace uh, and keeping harmony uh, in your home, in various environments. And I talked about some of the drawbacks or some of the pitfalls that also come from even the more um, benign forms of compassion and the civility that it comes in when you are using civility as a tool, using that form of compassion. But now what I want to do is talk about some more problematic aspects of compassion. This has to do with the fact that with the first one, like I said, it's a kumbaya world. Everybody is on the same page and things are moving along in a more harmonious way as a result of there being this kind of um, harmony that's already implicit in there being a great number of agreements that people have. And then there is the form that I call enrichment, which had to do with education, where let's say, for example, people aren't opposed to what you're saying or don't necessarily really disagree strongly, but they need more information in order for you to be able to have a go more cohesive sense of what you're going to be doing. So civility in that situation is how you present things with respect to education, being aware of not being condescending in the process. But now we move on to situations where people have very different view or different views or very different views from you. And there is definitely resistance in going along. And you might think, well, of course, uh, does a benign form of civility work? Well, oftentimes it does not if you're trying to just kind of schmooze people, so to speak. But I want to talk more about what is called more magnetizing or charismatic compassion in relation to civility and wrathful compassion. So again, I'm going to read the section that has to do with enrichment compassion first. To get to a state of harmony in action, there needs to be further education. And actually, I just realized that enrichment is, is the form that I described earlier. So I'm going to move forward to the next one. And I apologize for reiterating what I've said before, but it's not a bad idea just to mention to people things that you have done before. In the Indian tradition, for example, the idea of continuous repetition and repetition is one way, and this is something we don't do in our educational processes, which means I can also mention it right now if I'm talking about enrichment compassion, is the idea of how it used to be that rote memorization again and again and again and again, coming back to the same message, isn't necessarily nagging people if you make it so that it is making the suggestion and making the suggestion until there's a kind of entrainment that occurs where people begin to pay attention more to what it is you're saying. I mean, how many of us have recognized when we have read something and then 10 years later, we read it again, the exact same words, and suddenly they mean something very, very different. So in terms of enrichment compassion, as I've digressed, um, that is something to consider 
in terms of the educational process. But now let me move on to magnetizing compassion. Here, one meets resistance, indifference, views more rooted in what I've described as the three poisons of ignorance, attachment, and aggression. To influence the situation, the power of persuasion, the use of charisma, or more emotional slash feeling-based approach becomes necessary to rally support for the desired direction, action, or outcome. How can we attract those we need for successful action away from what we might define as the dark side, the opposing view? The focus of the conversation should be contrasting the consequences of unskillful action versus the rewards for skillful actions. To do this, while the presentation is more at an emotional or feeling level, the tone needs to be one of rationality, that one has carefully assessed the situation and wants to be informative for everyone's benefit. The tone of civility here is that of the statesman or the evocateur. The reactive pattern to safeguard against is manipulation, especially through inappropriate flattery. A useful phrase in this situation are, what are the pros and cons? How do you add the situation up? And if you're going to do that, you've got to make it so that when you're presenting the pros and the cons, you do it in a way that is very much on the level. You try and make it so that it doesn't seem like one side is more weighted than the other. Sometimes that's a challenge because sometimes you may feel really very impassioned by what's going on, but your impassioned perspective, if you don't look at it in a more rational way, can certainly be a turnoff for people who may be impassioned in their own way. So now we go on to the fourth form of compassion that works with civility, and this is wrathful compassion. Here, you are dealing with intractable people or a very difficult circumstance. Thus, confrontation or action to prevent action or decisions that are deemed harmful is considered necessary. It is always truly difficult to know if this is, in fact, the case. Hence, the three internal wisdoms need to be fully practiced here. The wisdom of equanimity may be hard to practice in engagement as there is obvious conflict. What I'm talking about in terms of the first three wisdoms is step back, assess, and reflect for yourself. Okay? How adversarial, how problematic is this situation? How well are you able to step back from your own emotional investment to make sure that what you're looking at in terms of what you think may occur is going to be harmful? So the wisdom of equanimity may be hard to practice with this conflict. Thus, one needs to be sure that no advantage is being taken or power employed just because you can do so. While the words or actions used may need to be stronger than you would normally use, perhaps even harsh, the use of this form of compassion must be rooted in love and humility. That this is the basis of the action taken will be seen in feelings of remorse or regret that actions of this nature needed to be enacted. I gave the example, for example, of a, of a mother who sees a child about ready to touch a stove, and she runs over and she screams, and she slaps or swipes the child's hand away from the stove, and the child cries. And the mother doesn't go up and say, you stupid little child, what did you think you were doing? Well, obviously, the child doesn't know what fire does. And in many situations, it can be, if you have a more distant perspective on a situation, you can see that something 
wrong will happen or something problematic will happen if someone continues down the path they're going. In the case of the child, what you do, hopefully if you're a wise parent, is to sit down with the child and basically soothe them and console them and then try to demonstrate to them why that's a problem. But you do it in a way that's very rational so that the next time it might even be just a serious or sternful glance is all you really need to do or a short word and that is it. That this is the basis of the action taken will be seen, like I said, in the feelings of remorse or regret as I've described. If possible, to express this remorse or regret can be necessary salve of civility in order for the party on the receiving end not to feel that you are merely acting in the reactive pattern. That reactive pattern is revenge or vengeance. So that is the reactive pattern that's there. There's a saying, it's an old Welsh saying, that says that uh, if you plan revenge, dig two graves. Thus, what happens is if you go at somebody in a vengeful and spiteful way, it's certainly not civil, okay? It does not mean, however, that harsh words need to be said, but there needs to be a way in which you can step forward. One of the phrases that I'm reminded of, a friend of mine who's a spiritual cosmologist, Jeffrey Bullington, once said that with your thought, regardless of what you're doing or what you want to see accomplished, you think in your mind for the goodness of all concerned. It's a very, very important thing to realize. And also with respect to this notion of vengeance or revenge, within the tradition of Buddhism, they talk about anger destroying virtue. And every one of us knows that. We can see that if we are in a really extreme situation and we lash out, we notice how exhausted we feel. We notice that in order to gain back good feeling takes much longer. It really, really does. That when you find yourself acting in a way where a, uh, an angry tone, where you're not able to really, in some ways, marshal your wrath in a more compassionate way, that what happens is you feel exhausted and oftentimes there are consequences that occur. I think about situations, for example, and this is one of the things when you look at um, what occurs afterwards when a vengeful action is done, and then you find out later on that what goes on is that someone comes back later on with their own version of vengeance. The tone of civility here is that of the protector because this form of compassion and its civility has the potential of bearing the most heat or of passion, staying focused on the issues rather than going after the personality or character of the person or persons can be more challenging. If one were to be rating civil discourse, probably any discourse that involves the degradation of another's character would be the lowest and most regrettable. But then again, sometimes in social and political arenas, humiliation may be necessary component in confrontation and or stopping harmful action. But I will argue that it would at the same time yield backlash that has to be addressed with a deeper sense of remorse. So in other words, what goes around comes around, and when you do that, there will be consequences. It may stop something from happening in the short run, but in the long run, there will be something that comes back. A useful phrase in wrathful compassion is, I regret to inform you. So in this situation, definitely what we are looking at is Civility has its place here. It has its place in terms, especially in terms of your intentionality, with your ability to be able to circumscribe or draw a boundary around those feelings which are definitely going to be triggering to not only yourself, but to others. How can you step forward? 
So, wrathful compassion would lead me into a discussion on civil disobedience, but I'm going to leave that topic for another time. Right now, what I want to remind people is the book is out this week. I look forward to you picking up The Path of Civility, uh, Amazon, or by contacting me. I hope you enjoyed. I'd love to hear your comments. This is really um, a talk of, topic of the time. Right now in this podcast, I am talking to you during the time of the political conventions that are going on in the United States. And as a result, there's a tremendous amount of challenge between civility and incivility that we see in the discourse around it. So I hope you find the book useful in that regard. Also, if you are in San Luis Obispo County at the end of the week on Saturday, the 29th of August, I will be at Coalesce Bookstore between 1 and 3. I'll be sitting out properly masked. Uh, what will happen is, if you like the book and you want to come by, you'll go into the store, and then you'll come out with your book, and I'll sign it. Happy to do so. Happy to chat with you. Hopefully, you'll be masked as well. Along with that, what I want to say is, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, my son with the Sladar Collective is going to be helping me to do a more national and internationally streamed book signing event on Sunday, September the 6th, between 1 and 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Then I'm going to be talking more. I might do some more quotes about the book. And at the same time, maybe I don't know if it's possible to get some of your questions. If you want to email me with questions that you would like me to address before I do that live streamed event, I would be happy to address them. So at this point, I want to thank you all for listening. And we're going to continue on with this dialogue of Civility Speaks later on. Thanks so much for listening.